This is about you. The infinite you. The part of you that can't be seen, can't be smelled, touched, or tasted. But you know you feel it. Who you really are. In a world lost to confusion, a universe that's partly illusion, when we look for meaning, we often simply find more delusion. Ground your consciousness in the sounds of the universe, a podcast about your true omnipotence. There's a universe inside each of us, but our beliefs keep us constrained to the edges of what we can imagine. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garden and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the one within all to the inner verse coming at you from inner space. I'm your host chance and I'm feeling aligned, activated and altogether jazzed up to bring forward another powerful transmission from the infinite source to your conscious mind. It may just be a symptom of the springtime season, but I feel we're collectively reaching new heights of awareness and awesomeness that can hardly be translated into English. And I hope you're feeling the same enthusiasm and love for life that I am, because our passion for playing in this third dimension is our primary fuel source for pushing past 3D limitations and forward to the nth dimensional beyond. My love for creating this show has never been bigger, and it has a lot to do with today's incredible first-time Interverse guest, Zane Daniel. He's truly a guy after my own heart with a background in video game development and a new career as a light working comic book author. And there are so many delicious fun nuggets on our plate today, thanks to Zane, that it'll be hard to fit into one episode, but we will do our best. Considering that I spent the greater part of my early life hypnotically transfixed to the television doing marathon video game sessions, Zane's transition from that field to the realm of conscious comics really mirrors my own awakening process, as the comic book medium was a big factor in my own realization that our imagination creates the reality we experience. And whether it's positive or negative, what we take in as entertainment is always symbolically charged with the information we're most needing to see for our own growth. And this episode with Zane is pretty much guaranteed to be a catalyst to your spiritual evolution because we'll be talking about his Shakti-infused comic series Righteous. And Zane is also a powerful channel for Higher Self who uses soul-activating sound harmonics to dissolve the internal barriers we've built up through traumatic experiences in order to draw our soul's essence to the surface of our being and help us embody our most needed positive past life traits while letting go of limiting beliefs. This specialty skill set that he has developed with help from Hathor, Arcturian, and Andromedan star nations and plant medicine journeys allows Zane to provide one-on-one chakra activating healing sessions for anyone that needs them. And I can affirm that his methods are powerful and universally effective for those who are open-minded and ready to evolve. As exciting as all that is, Zane's most potent magic can be found by checking the show notes for a link to Zane and his international team of creators' comic book story called Righteous, which is basically a blueprint for mass spiritual awakening in humankind that will inspire you to love life and everyone in it while letting go of the fear that we don't have enough to go around. This is one of the few times I recommend actually pausing the show and coming back to it later so you can go check out Righteous at RighteousComic.com which I've linked in the show notes. But if you don't go straight away, don't worry. We won't be spoiling the narrative in this chat. 
And if you do find yourself interested in one-on-one sessions for soul activation with Zane, you can connect with his Radical Radiance at zanedaniel.com, which is spelled with an X, not a Z. Now it's time to remember our breath Ground and root ourselves to the Earth Star Chakra below and anchor down the Cosmic Sky Father energy from above. We are the bridge between spirit and matter. And each day we are awakening more and more to the truth that there never was a separation. It's all connected. Earth and sky, body and mind, soul and spirit, me and you. We are all one We are alone and yet vast and limitless because we are infinite and therefore we're always in the process of learning who we are on a deeper level. For every answer, there are always more questions and we can be grateful for the free energy and enthusiasm that knowing this truth provides us. Now that we're awake, aware, and energized, please join me in combining our loving awareness towards Zane into a lightning bolt of grateful appreciation, striking from whenever and wherever you are in space and time to thank this epic co-creator for coming back to Earth for another round in an incredibly meaningful timeline. He is the high-energy healer from Hathor and the visionary veteran of the video game industry, and I'm super happy that he hit me up for this chat so I could discover the greatness he's sharing with the world. Zane, my man, thanks so much for being here, and welcome to the Interverse. Thank you so much. Wow, what an introduction. <laughs> that, that's amazing. I sound so cool. What the heck? I didn't even know I was that. To be honest, it was hard for me to feel I even did you justice with that introduction. I may even revise it. We'll see. (laughs) I want to kick off with the synopsis of Righteous because I can't stop telling people about it. To me, it's like, you know how everyone's obsessed with the zombie apocalypse? Well, what if there was the opposite of that? (laughs) Right. Yeah, I know. Uh, Thank you. And, and, you know, I really am very happy with the way that it is turning out. Um, And there's so much more story to write. But essentially... What we've got is we take a greedy corporate analyst and we have him visited by a being of light that touches him on the forehead and changes him so that he can only help others and he can't really make money for himself anymore. This is the the quick foundation as to where the comic goes. And and really, it's written for a mass market audience. So I I throw in a few references for, for other people that are light workers or or are into this this spiritual world but it could be written i mean it can be read by anyone and and i think that there's a lot of power to that because my goal is to awaken as many people as possible and so if joe average says hey this is a spiritual book i'm not interested in spirituality then he won't even pick it up um but but this is a story that really kind of comes from you know, essentially like the movie Liar Liar, where we've got a a lying um, lawyer who has a supernatural event occur where he can't lie anymore. It's the same exact thing, except this time he can't make money. He can only help others. So that, at, w- with one more twist, and that twist is that every time he helps someone, he passes it on to them too. They get it as well. That twist is really the crux of it. And I think it's something that mirrors a process that actually is really happening on Earth right now. But maybe your version of it is like an accelerated version of it, you could say. What I've been really trying to hammer home for people that want to uh, question whether or not we can live without these centralized control systems like, like government and such is that, well, if we all actually looked at each other like our family and that we were just trying to help each other and not make a buck off of each other, we wouldn't need the whole commerce game at all. And actually, commerce is a form of warfare if you look at it on the basic spiritual level. Okay, so capitalism is the free market system. It's a good system in principle, trading things for other things. You, if, you, if you go to trade somebody a whole bunch of tomatoes for their you know, tapestry, well, your tomatoes could go bad. And so now you don't have anything. So you know, currency is a, is a good concept. But unfortunately, we're in the late stage uh, of capitalism. And so we've figured out all the solutions, all the, 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 the loopholes. That's what we do. I mean, we as humans have figured out exactly how water runs downhill and we take full advantage of that. We've figured out uh, how to plant seeds and how they grow into crops and so on and so forth. We figure out our environment. 
And, and with capitalism, with the monetary system, we created it, that system. And so we really know it. And especially as the years go on and the years go on and the, and the generations go on, we're trying to figure out ways to t- take advantage of it, just like we do our natural environment. So it's not a surprise that we have to now create all of these kinds of um, limitations. Well, you know, all these rules, all these regulations, because we can take advantage of each other with this, this system. And really what it b- boils down to is it's just an incentive program. We are incentivized to do something other than just sit on our asses all day. We're incentivized to get up, go to work, and, and produce something that other people find valuable. And unfortunately, the way that we've kind of manipulated the, the system is that we are now incentivized to make money over helping other people. So, you know, the, the whole competition concept, when, it, when anybody defends capitalism, they talk about, well, you know, lions have to kill gazelles, right? Like, you know, so it's the strongest survive. Well, but does it really have to be that way? Do we have to translate that into our incentive program? I don't think we do. If we had an incentive program that said, okay, so uh, the first company that, that, that feeds the entire world gets $1 billion a year to do it. Do you know how fast that would happen? It would be so, you'd be ridiculous. There would be so many companies competing for whatever that is. I mean, maybe 1 billion isn't the right number, right? But, but you figure that out and, and suddenly everyone is fed. And then the next one is, oh, okay, we, we'll give you 5 billion if everybody ha- has a place to live. Okay, well, boy, that got figured out even faster than the food one. So it's just an incentive program. Why can't we incentive each, incentivize each other to do the right thing? And so all of that to, to say that if everybody already just wanted to help each other, then we don't even need the incentive program anymore. We just get excited about helping others. We get excited about seeing other people succeed instead of ourselves. And, and, it, and we live in a utopian society. I think that's totally on on the money, so to speak. <laughs> what you're saying is we ha- obviously have the resources required to build the utopia. It's just the mind virus that, or the heart virus in general that is stopping us from doing that. And part of it is the system of incentivization that you're talking about big time. But on the other hand, it's like, let's talk about what the real motivator is with that incentive. Is it love or fear? And how can we flip that? Well, okay. Yes, it's fear. I mean, think about our ancestors. Our primitive ancestors had to use fear fear in order to survive and then create us. So we come from a long line of fearing creatures. So, you know, we, we can't blame ourselves for that. That's the way we're pre-programmed. And especially in primitive times, we needed that in order to survive. But now in these times, we don't need that. And I even uh, talk about this in a little blurb in the comic where, okay, so they, they used to have to, our primitive ancestors had to, maybe they had to take uh, turtle shells to the river and bring water back to the tribe uh, so that everybody could drink. And they had to worry because maybe the saber tooth tigers would be drinking that day. So they had to use fear to avoid that, to be careful, to try to plan it out, to try to understand when they were going to be there and use whatever tricks they needed to, to survive that very important endeavor. Whereas today we walk over and we turn on the faucet. So the need for that sort of overwhelming fear is just almost eliminated, but we still have it and we still bring it with us. And of course, again, as we were talking about in the capitalist incentive program, we are incentivized to make more money. And how do we make more money? Well, we've got to look at the, at the individuals that we're trying to make the money from. What are the buttons that we can push to make the most money from them? Oh, well, they've got this built-in fear response. So this is a very easy button that we can push. Okay, we're going to push that button. Does that make us evil for pushing the, 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 the fear button? Not necessarily, because we're, again, incentivized to bring in money for our families and for the people that we care about. And everyone is incentivized to do that. And so, and so we're, quote unquote, doing the right thing because we're following that system that has been created many ge- generations before we were even born. So 
I am not one to look toward anyone in the whole program, in the whole system, and say that person is evil because they are taking advantage of our fears. They are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing based on the incentive program that is, is in place. Exactly. And that actually came from our grandparents, our great grandparents, our, the ancestors who were actually us. And to be judgmental of someone for following that program to a T is kind of the same as being like really judgmental of the way that your great grandparents believed about the universe. When you have this information in 2019 and they were in whatever year it was for them, it's not fair, honestly. <laughs> and what the real solution is, isn't to fight that. It's to build something new out of the tools that we've got. So <laughs> Righteous is truly infectious. The book, I, I hope everyone does get a chance to check it out because I personally felt the catalyst for, I mean, I was already in this flow whenever I discovered Righteous of that the fear that there's not enough is an illusion. The fear of anything is an illusion, ultimately, because even if you get killed by the uh, saber-toothed tiger in the long, long ago, it's not like it's the end of you. And even in fact, that, that uh, seemingly negative event of the death is a teaching experience for the rest of your tribe and for your future self. So there's not such a thing as mistakes in the, uh, the grand scheme of things. There's just learning. Yes, absolutely. One of my first downloads that I ever received was talking about that. And it was simply, it was a message that, that came from uh, a deceased loved one to another through me, actually. And the, the message was simply, you've never made a mistake ever in your entire life. Everything you've ever done has been perfect. And it's the reason that you're exactly where you are right now. So congratulations, because you did it. And as a matter of fact, you'll never make another mistake again. You will do everything perfectly, exactly as you're supposed to, to get the lessons and to get the, the life that you wanted before, before you even came here. So congratulations in advance on that too. That's such a cool story. I don't want to make you exactly rehash it because what I'd rather do is point people to a video, which I'll link in the show notes, where you give a talk at the Awake and Empowered Expo, which was just phenomenal. I mean, there's so much to that talk. And we will visit certain parts of it that I think are worth revisiting. Not that that story isn't worth revisiting. But what you're describing, being able to channel a message from a loved one, it really resonated with me because I actually have had a similar experience one time where the, uh, the part that really resonated with me was when this person that you're speaking with asked them how, how their mother was, which is who you were channeling, their mother. And... <laughs> What you describe as the unconditional love and bliss and, and joy that came through, um, I know exactly what you mean because I once channeled a friend's grandfather and uh, had so much unconditional love and, and I guess just that word, unconditional, well, pride, really. It was proud. I was proud of this other person <laughs> in a way that I wasn't in my conscious individual self because I didn't sort of spawn them, you could say. And that feeling was so overwhelming that I was in tears. And it was like, the way I describe it, it was like the faucet of unconditional love and pride was turned on. And then it turned back off. So I went from like nothing, normal state to completely overwhelmed with this emotion and then back to normal. Is that kind of, <laughs> is that kind of mirror what it's like for you? Yeah. And uh, it definitely is. Uh, because when you bring in that information, you bring in that energy, you process it in the same way that you do in a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, just if all of a sudden I, I, you know, brought in this, this information, this, this energy while we were on this call, I would be like, you know, blah, what the heck, you know, this is amazing. What is happening to me? And I would have that same experience. And then, and then it would be suddenly over and I'd be back to just like, Oh, Hey, how's it going? So I, I totally understand and, and have experienced that though, you know, it is, even though, though that is a very important part of my backstory, um, now uh, I don't, I don't channel the the people that have passed, um, and that there's a long story as to why that doesn't happen anymore. But I could give you the real quick summary, and that is simply that when your vibration is at a certain level, you're more likely to bring in the the voices or the the, the spirits of that vibrational level. And so, 
a lot of times our our local ancestors who have passed are are actually at somewhat of a lower vibration and and I went through kind of intense training to raise my vibration and as part of that training then uh, I ceased to bring in the the l- local past uh, ancestors and moved more into uh like you said the what did you call them the star communities oh the star nations star nations yeah i like that i've not heard anybody say that um the star nations like the hathors and the the pleiadians or whoever totally makes sense for me and even after i had that one experience i definitely didn't get like caught up on trying to recreate it or or be some kind of a medium or channel for those who have passed on because that incarnation even of that person isn't their only incarnation Actually, when you get into channeling information from the star nations, you're getting a lot closer to the source of both yourself and the, those uh, recently deceased local ancestors. So, <laughs> in fact, those local ancestors that hang around that don't go back to sort of the, the, the source, so to speak, are in many ways related to stuck energy in the field and in the environment. So, if you're in a personal free flow of energy, the stuff that's stuck... It, you're not really going to experience stuff that's stuck and hanging around that's um, more time bound, you could say. At least that's kind of my, that's kind of what I'm getting, thinking about it. But to return to righteous, because we did get away from it a little bit, I want to make sure we talk a little bit more about it because I have a few specific questions before we get on to some very far and beyond es- esoterica type topics. <laughs> awesome. I'm, I'm curious, are you finding it difficult to intend to make money since you've gone through this shift? Because I, I just bring this up from my own experience. I've been shifting into freelance work as a graphic designer, website developer, and dang it, I have, I cannot make myself charge someone a lot of money. I only seem to want to seek out the jobs where the person doesn't have a lot of money, but really needs the help to get started. And so it's not really helping me get out of my nine to five, but I'm okay with that. I'm just curious what you're thinking on, on that subject. Oh, it's been such an interesting journey. I, I totally hear everything that you're saying there. And I put a lot of thought into it. Um, you know, I was in the video game industry for 20 plus years and I was a producer, became a senior producer. I was an executive producer. So, uh, during those years, my, my money was not an issue at all. Like it was very easy to come by. And I was, uh, I actually started working on the comic book while I was still working in the video game industry. And so I used the money that I was making from that to pay the artists, uh, to, to create the comic book. And, and then, so as I went through a, a very, you know, that, that training that I was talking about, that intense training. I became less and less interested in working in the video game industry. And I knew that I had to branch out. I knew I had to stop doing that. And so even though that I did, and I branched out with no source of income coming whatsoever, and I wasn't a big saver, uh, I tended to spend the money on things that excited me uh, and not just put away a big nest egg. So it's not like I had a lot to, to rely on. And so I immediately or fairly shortly thereafter, I, I quit the, the video game job. I kind of started to panic and said, what the heck did I just do? Because I don't have an income now to do all these things that I really want to do. And I didn't expect that. I, ex- you know, I kind of said, I'll figure it out. You know, I'm going to go with the universe. The universe will got my back and blah, blah, blah. So I tried it and I got scared. And so what I ended up doing is... Uh, aligning myself with the energy of money. And, and I had to do that through uh, working with other light workers. Uh, they helped me quite a bit. And then, and then I discovered a modality that allows for that sort of kind of left brain, right, right brain thinking. So if you're in, in many cases, your left brain and your right brain, especially, especially related to money, do not align. So maybe your left brain says, um, yeah, I know I'll be fine. And the right brain says, hell no, I don't know. Where's the money coming from? You know, and, and so you have this imbalance. And so I was actually able to uh, balance the right and the left hemispheres of my brain through a process that allowed me to now look at money as 
you know, just something that I'm aligned with and that I'm provided for and that it, when I need it, it will be there. Um, and one of the greatest parts of it all is I'm completely at peace with money. I still don't have a ton. I don't suddenly have millions of dollars that I get to spend on all of this, but, but I, it just kind of appears and, and just enough. And so I'm not sitting with, you know, a giant house or a boat or anything like that. I, you know, I actually live in a tiny little space and that, cause that's all I really need. So it's, it really is about finding peace. And sometimes you can't find peace because of that left and right brain imbalance. I totally vibe with what you're saying. I'm actually on the tail end of an experiment where I am spending money in a journal, like imaginary money, you could say, and ramping up the amount I spend in it each day based on a Fibonacci sequence. So quickly, I've gotten to the point where there's so much money in this imaginary spending that I don't even know what to do with it. And it got into, <laughs> it started to resemble very much like what the character Daniel Price from Righteous is doing with his story, which is trying to find a way to use this incentive system to create stuff to permaculture the world in a way. <laughs> right. And, what What's brilliant about it is you're retraining through this process that I've been doing, and you can find it on um, my Facebook and YouTube. I've done a lot of live stream videos about it with with other people who are participating. What What we're doing is retraining ourselves to expect that there will always be abundance and that there will be more the next day and there's no wrong answers because greed, even the greed of like hoarding your money is fear, right? It's all right. fear based. Right. Yeah. And I actually know a little bit about your experiment and I, wa I watched at least one of your videos about that. So it sounded very interesting. I'm, I'm very curious to hear how it goes for you. I expect that it's not going to be one of those things that happens instantaneously because we are in 3D, that there has to be time for things to, sh to take sure. place and shift. Sure. But uh, it's not really something I need to happen at any certain time because like you said, I've always had the, the knowledge that there's going to be enough there's always exactly enough, and I don't need to be greedy beyond that. Actually, there's more than enough for me. I've been doing awesome, but I would like to. I'm I'm happy to reduce some of my material wealth in order to get more freedom. Because freedom, sure. as you posted on Instagram, freedom is the absence of fear, which I think is so genius. But what we're doing, I guess, overall, is shifting from being careful, like careful that something bad is going to happen if we make a mistake, to being careful like so full of care about everything that you don't even have time to think about the fear part. Yeah, that's beautiful. And there's actually a couple of things that you said during all that that I want to comment on. Um, one of the things that you said was, well, you almost, you've defined that maybe it doesn't come that fast because it's the three-dimensional world. So you've created that limit for yourself. <laughs> so watch out for that it, it's very easy to do and then you said well it's okay i don't need it to happen blah you know xyz so you were protecting your own self by saying that statement so you were looking at tamping down your fear so you don't need to do that both of those statements are are, are mm, in your way Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. I, part of this process and even doing those live videos, I caught, I've caught that in myself a few times, but it definitely helps to have that awareness shown to me that I basically can just ditch all the limitations and ditch all the self-protection and <laughs> just, just be in it. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. And it's hard to do because we go down those paths because We've been trained to think that it's limited and it, we've been trained to believe that uh, that our dreams aren't really possible and we have to protect ourselves from failing. Um, and and when you really just I just pictured like uh, taking your your shirt and your, your like coat and ripping it off, you know, from the front and going, bring it to me, whatever you've got. And just you know, move forward, run forward toward w what excites you. Then that coat represented the fear that you had, and the and the things that were blocking you. And you just drop that behind you as you run forward. This is a very, very good point to transition. I think into talking about your past with video games a little bit, 
something I was really interested in talking about just because I've had, like I said in the intro, the better part of my life was spent treating video games like they were my full-time job. <laughs> and especially as a teenager and er- in my early 20s, and that's tapered down to the point where now I still enjoy them. And I still personally think that there's a place for conscious video games in our future. But overall, to me, I was treating it like a substance abuse thing. Like I was replay, I was instead of working on myself and seeing what needed to change, I was just filling every gap I could with that. So, what what are your thoughts on sort of this what you could call the false light matrix of things that we do to distract ourselves, literally reduce our own traction because we're afraid of not being able to cut it once we uh, actually do start to engage the process of our evolution? Okay, so the first thought I have is that. I fully believe, yeah, I'm sure you're familiar with Bashar, right? Yes. Bashar is is great in his w- one piece of advice, and I can't state it enough. It is follow your highest excitement with no expectation to the results. And so if your highest excitement is playing effing video games, and you really feel great about playing effing video games, then do that. Because that's what I did as I, and when I was a kid. And guess what happened? I became a video game producer and it changed my life. And that was exactly what I was supposed to do because it introduced me to the people that I needed to be introduced to that eventually catalyzed, is that even a word? My awakening. So, so I feel that we get hung up on what's wrong and not, and we don't spend enough time about thinking about what's right. And yes, yes, it can be another addiction and it can be a distraction from our great happiness and, and our, our growth and, and blah, blah, blah. But the problem with all of that is that that isn't the problem. It is something that happened to you between the ages of two and eight that now make you addicted to something, whether it be video games or alcohol or whatever. And, and so those things need your, your, your time and attention. And, and not the, the video games aren't the culprit in that case. That totally makes sense because there's a lot about who I am and how I see the world that came out of those many hours spent in front of a screen. And even just the fact that that was how I was behaving gives me plenty of arrows and clues to point back towards what you're describing in the early part of life. I, I can see it clearly in myself how that's connected. So, you know, and there's, of course, there's so much to be said about the positive stuff in video games that if we were just maybe not like, we're making games like Mortal Kombat so much. <laughs> right, right. Because that was one that you were working on, which I think is a, an extreme example, a, definitely an extreme example of uh, some of the negative archetypes. But there's like an entire huge group of artists that come together to create a video game. It is truly an amazing medium that is... Uh, only maybe rivaled by that of modern filmmaking, that there's so right. many people working together for one vision. And yep. so many times I've been just dazzled and blown away by the beauty and, and the artistry in a game and the music and the, the plot and the storyline. But then at some point that shifted, and I think it has a lot to do with the w- direction that the game industry shifted. So I'm curious about your thoughts on this, where games became RPGified, but not in the s- sense of being a role-playing game where you're filling the shoes of a character and putting yourself there and feeling immersed. And instead it was like all those little mechanics of character development and uh, spending experience points to improve skills and all that. In a long, long time ago, when I was a kid, when you bought a video game, it came, you, it came with all the features unlocked, so to speak. And now almost every game has this basically endless progression built into it that I believe really taps into and hijacks our own inner innate uh, desire for growth and evolution. And so it it takes away from the immersion and the beauty and the the role-playing aspect of games and makes it like a job, which is how I see it. (laughs) Right. Right. Well, once again, we have ourselves the incentive program. And the incentive program says, how can we make more money? What do we have to tap into to make more money? What are humans uh, mm, apt to do. Humans are apt to uh, have a scoring system and have the most whatever points at the end. 
and so that they can brag. Why do they need to brag? So that they can feel good about themselves. Why don't they feel good about themselves? Because something that happened to them between the ages of two and eight, probably. Um, so it all comes back to these sorts, these same sorts of things. And we can, again, we can blame the video game companies and the manufacturers for, for putting us in a treadmill and making us run toward the piece of cheese that it, you can't quite get to. Um, however, they're doing what they think is right to make the money and, and because that's what's important in this society. At the same time, that is one of the reasons that I had to leave the industry because I, I saw through the 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 system i throw i saw through the incentive program and i said i don't want to participate in this anymore i know that i don't need to do that in order to make money for myself to survive and so it was an easy much much easier decision and and like your um the reference that you made to mortal combat that was a perfect example of getting the opportunity to work on mortal combat holy cow i mean my you know i I had probably been in the industry for 18 years before I got to work on Mortal Kombat. It was super like, wow, that's this is I could t say that the name of this title to anyone and they would say, wow, you worked on Mortal Kombat. Amazing. And it wasn't 10 minutes <laughs> into watching the, the very early versions uh, where we, we zoom in on the bones as they're being cracked and broken. And we hear the curdling screams of the of the victim of this where we're using an x-ray view to see those bones breaking that I go, what in the hell are we doing? Are we are really, really trying to just make it more and more and more grotesque or over the top or whatever shock value. And what, are, what positive thing are we bringing to society for that? And as I said, in that story, it was amazing because when we went to release the PC version of Mortal Kombat 10, uh, it didn't go very well. We had a problem with our, our release and, and the fans were upset that it wasn't, it wasn't downloading properly off of Steam or whatever. And, you know, I mean, what? We were four hours late or something. The, the amount of, of anger and the amount of, of rage that we received was complete, completely shocking. And, and, you know, they were threatening to kill our families with these messages that they were leaving. And, and I remember our owner or the creative content officer saying something like, what is wrong with these people? Why are they doing this? And, and it's just so obvious. These are people that play the most brutal game known to man. So they want to brutalize those who didn't bring them to them on time. So it, it, it doesn't add to society in any way. But Video games in so many other ways can add to society. One of my favorite uh, things doing with playing games was getting a, a, a group of my friends together and playing team games. You learn teamwork, you learn strategy, you learn le leaning on each other, you learn like, you know, the camaraderie, the high fiving. It's just like any team sport or anything, but it's, it's very easy to access and very easy to do. These are brilliant things that, that games bring to us. And so if they're used, correctly, then they can be huge and we can follow our highest excitement, like I talked about before. But of course, they can also be used to brutalize people. I think you're totally right. You just kind of made me reflect on a part of my life that I'd really judge myself over. And now that I'm rethinking it, I'm like, actually, no, this was good. <laughs> In the beginning of college, it's my first year, especially, I pretty much just ditched all of the responsibilities of schoolwork and homework and even occasionally going to class itself, although I usually at least would do that. And I spent my time as a guild leader on World of Warcraft. And <laughs> basically, this is a game called Warcraft. I mean, it's about war. It's about right. fighting and killing. It's a little cartoony. It's definitely not as like bloody and grotesque as some video games. And in that sense, it's more palatable to me. I like the color and I like the art. I like the lore. I love the huge world that they've built. There's so much about it I love. I even still love to this day. To be honest, I've played World of Warcraft this year, and it's a game that's like 15 years old at this point. But now I have a different taste in my mouth with it, and it has a lot to do with how the game has changed. It feels more like a single-player game than it ever did back in the day. But what's positive about this that I'm just now coming to is that while spending all that time as a guild leader, I learned how to manage people, how to communicate with people, how to resolve problems that two people had with each other so that we could work together as a team. I mean, so much uh, coordination, time management, uh, 
So there's a lot that I got out of that that actually is probably more valuable than what I would have got from memorizing facts from a book that might not even exactly be true. <laughs> Bingo. Yes. Yeah, so good. Absolutely. And that's what I loved about it. And I love the teamwork aspect. That was always my favorite too. And I remember when, uh, I, you know, I'd been in the industry for 20 years, so I kind of got tired of playing games on my own. Like I wasn't really interested in doing that anymore. So I, I remember people saying like, what's your favorite game? Uh, well, actually my favorite game is called, Hey, let's make a game together. Uh, because I really liked having the artists, having the programmers, having the designers, having the audio personnel, and all of us working together to craft something that we were excited about and that we were proud of and that would go out into the world. So I get it. Totally. I've had this sort of thought lately that that games and basically the entertainment culture could almost represent a col- the final frontier of colonization, which is colonizing the imagination and the mind. Because this is not to focus on the negative too much, but I do find that whenever I spend an inordinate amount of time with that type of entertainment, that my mind goes there when I'm not doing it. And I start like imagining what I'm going to do in the game and all of that. And I see that as a detriment to me being in the present moment to a large degree. And that's my, that's my place. Like, that doesn't mean that I couldn't play some games in a balanced way and not get obsessed. And even it's also cool that when I realize that I'm off somewhere else, I'm in this game and not in here and now, that because I have the, I'm able to observe that, then I'm growing from that observation. And I'm not, it's not like it was when I was just totally ate up by it when I was younger. But I just experienced my grandmother uh, passing. And I spent a lot of time with her in this period. And one of the things she revealed to me, which was truly amazing, was that she actually spent a lot of her time with her eyes closed and in a different world where she had mostly been cooped up in an assisted living place for years. And she revealed to me something I don't think she even told anyone else because it was quote unquote crazy, but that she would actually be in the forest with a tribe like natives, like native peoples gathering things, crafting things, making baskets, gossiping, hanging out, enjoying the sunshine. And she somehow had this ability, I believe it's a shamanic ability, to just transfer herself to that world when she wasn't enjoying this world. And because we spend so much time being entertained by all the things that are available to us, many of us may not even know that we have that ability. So this is not to just be like video games of the devil or anything, but I want to bring that out that We don't want to have our imagination so completely colonized by entertainment that we lose our natural faculties. That's beautiful. I like that a lot. And, uh, and it is something to, to wrestle with and to improve, especially if you're on the pursuit of self growth. And interestingly, I I guess I, I start to categorize, I go, okay, well, Joe average isn't going to close his eyes and isn't going to colonize his imagination. And he isn't going to discover the indigenous people in the forest in his mind. He's going to be entertained. And so, but, and so I can't say, well, he shouldn't do that. Like that's my judgment going on to his life and his life experience. That's kind of what I am against, I suppose. Um, but now, yes, if you if you have become enlightened, if you have become awakened to some degree, then you're going to be more excited about that self growth, and so you're going to spend less time in that entertainment. And so, and it, I'm going to bring it back to the comic here because what's what I really wanted to do is what percentage of people sit around and watch entertainment or or, or participate in entertainment. A lot, (laughs) a really dang large number, right? And so if I can create an entertainment type, an entertainment, a a story that is gripping and compelling and interesting to the entire, to that entire crowd, to that entire group, and they watch it and, and, or read it in this case, I say watch it because I'm going to be making it into a TV show or a movie eventually then all of a sudden now we've tapped into this place that they go to all the time and we've 
hit something, we've had a catalyst moment where they go, wait a minute, everything I've been doing is kind of wrong, maybe. I kind of like what this character is doing, and, I, and I'm rooting for him to succeed. I want this guy who can't make money for himself anymore to never make money for himself again. Wait a minute. Why am I rooting for that? That goes against capitalism. Capitalism is my friend, isn't it? Oh, no. Well, now what am I going to do? So, you know, that's, that's the whole goal with that. And I think that that method or that approach, that entertainment approach is my favorite to hit the mass market. Well, I love that you're doing it for the mass market like that, because a lot of what I'm doing here is a similar intention. Like, I want to be entertaining. I personally find this conversation right now super entertaining, but I want it to have something that you can keep and like take with you that catalyzes growth and change. Yes. And because we get into some of the more esoteric ideas, I don't actually always try to look at it as like a mass market thing or for Joe Average, but I don't want to leave Joe Average out. You know what I mean? I want to trust that. And I think you do too. I think that you do do this, but I want to trust that what resonates, what they need to hear through this will be what they get. And then what, if they are open to it, they'll, they'll receive it. And then other than that, we're planting seeds. So I think that the, the seeds can, they need to be planted. And sometimes seeds take a long time to actually sprout when the conditions become right, they will. So (laughs) speaking of sprouting seeds though, (laughs) I want to jump I want to jump to a different topic while we're at this point in the show, because it's so, to me, I think it's so awesome what you do with Soul Essence Activations. (laughs) I would like to hear about that and maybe what someone could expect from a one-on-one, because I would love it if our audience hit you up for that, the ones that are most interested. Okay. Sounds good. Well, I have to step back because I was definitely not into all this stuff all that long ago. I was, I was raised in a scientific family that, you know, I had engineers on both sides of my family. And the, again, capitalism was the way to, to be successful and to be happy. And religion and spirituality was not even discussed. It was just this crazy concept that uh, some large portion of the people believed in, but they were wrong. And so we didn't even discuss it. It wasn't even a topic. So so for me to go from that experience to 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 <laughs> changing so much like this this absolute 180 and and do awakenings and activations these weirdo words that only woo woo people would ever use is is quite the shock and and it took some crazy catalysts to get me there but I did and so as a result I'm <laughs> I think that I bring with me that hmm, skepticism. I bring with me that science mindset that says, well, did this really work? Did this really help the person? Because that's what I care about. Yes, that I can get paid for my session. Wonderful. But if we didn't really help the person, I, I want to pay them <laughs> uh, because that we didn't succeed. And so it's all about how do we actually help people with with real problems that they really have and that can make a huge difference in their life. And no matter what the goal is for each individual, the, the ultimate goal is peace because the reason that they're there is because they want to achieve something or they want something bad in their life to go away. And in, in either case, we're shooting for peace. And and actually, it's amazing because peace is achievable. And so, uh, what you know, I, I've got a couple of different modalities, but I would say that the most prominent one is the soul essence activation that you talk about. So it was fairly after I raised my vibration through that training that I was talking about. Uh, I was able to start working with that star. Oh man, I want to say it, star. Star yeah. nations. Nation. Why See, can't I think of the word nation? A lot of our indigenous tribes around here refer to them as the star nations. And I like that nomenclature. Yeah, it's cool. I really like it. I wish I could remember it. Anyway, the star nation the, of the Hathors, uh, the Arturians, like you talked about. And and when that began to happen, then all of a sudden I was getting all kinds of information as to what I should do. 
And I also oh, do have done ayahuasca a number of times. And during one of my ayahuasca experiences, they came to me and they just said, okay, this is how you do it. And they outlined the entire process. And so the, what, what's happening is all of us have multiple incarnations, whether they're on this planet or they're on others. And those incarnations, kind of all their, their characteristics are available to us because, you know, there is no time. And so all of our different incarnations are happening simultaneously. And so if you have a past incarnation that uh, was highly confident, um, and, and, but in this one, you don't, what we're going to do is we're going to align that trait from that previous incarnation into your current incarnation. And we do this using the, I keep saying we, because I'm working with the Hathor. So it's, it's me and my Hathor buddies. Um, we're, we're bringing, uh, we're, we're using the, the chakras to, to, to bring that forward. And so in the case of the confidence example, of course, we're, we're working with the solar plexus. But I think it's important because the amount of energy that the Hathors bring forward during the soul essence activation is so great that you really need to do all seven chakras because they will all be humming at a level that, that they probably haven't hummed at before unless you've had a lot of work done on your chakras. And if you just bring one of those to a very high energy level, uh, the, the problem is that that, that that flow of energy from the root to the crown is not there to kind of support it. And so it can kind of fizzle out. So it's really important to do all seven. And so through the, the methods that I, I was explained that I was told by the Hathors, um, we do this systematically through generally the base seven chakras. Uh, the, I can also work on other chakras, the meridians, all kinds of different things, but usually it's the chakras, the seven. Well, I'd actually experienced it when you did the soul essence activation in the video that I mentioned that I shared from the Awaken Empowered Expo. And that's, like I said, that's in the show notes. I would ask you to do it for us here, but I would rather spend the time continuing to discuss things because we could easily direct people to that incredibly well done video that you've got there. And I hope people do check that out. I want people to dig into everything you're doing. It's been a big boost to me to do that, <laughs> especially right. especially the comic though. The comic really does fulfill its intention of inspiring and catalyzing a fearless approach towards just giving and loving, which I right. think is back to the money thing. I think that's what opens us up to receive is that we also have to give. Uh, the right. more that... I've, I'm finding that the more that I do increase the energy in my chakras or improve their spin, so to speak, get, get them going, mm -hmm. that the throughput, part of that requires that I imp increase my throughput. So the amount that I can actually achieve in a day, while I have had to learn not to be stressed out if I don't fulfill the same amount of completion that I did in a previous day, but the amount that I can do in a day is just going up and up and up, which goes back to that thing about time not really existing, that you always have the time that you need. And mm -hmm. it's this uh, sort of time is money thing that is part of what's hurting us more, more or less. So I do hope people can get on zanedaniel.com, connect with you about some soul essence activation, because I think it's really cool and would probably be even more powerful one-on-one. -on -one. And while we're on the topic of activating... One of my favorite things to talk about ever is crystals. So mm -hmm. tell us something about your experiences with activating crystals and, and um, the results of that and sort of the evidence for timeline jumps because that's the most interesting thing. I know. It's, it's so neat. What a, what, what a fun journey that was. That really started because I was working with a very powerful light worker and I had just given them a soul essence activation. We were on a video chat. And they grabbed a crystal off to the side. It was just sitting on their desk and they put it in front of the camera and they said, this crystal wants you to activate it. And I went, oh, well, that's a cool idea. Let's try that. And, and so the moment that I did, <laughs> um, we lost connection and, and he had to call me back and he said, there was like an arc of electricity that went from my freaking crystal to my phone and it, and then I, my phone rebooted. 
<laughs> so that was the first time where I went, okay, that sounds pretty cool. That sounds like some actual physical evidence that you don't get very much in this world. And so that, you know, it just went on from there. And as I spoke more with the Hathors and I, I channeled with some other great light workers, we kind of figured out a lot about what's happening. And so if I were to activate a crystal, like uh, a crystal of yours, say, then what, what's going to happen is that its consciousness is going to kind of move into your consciousness, the, the vibration of your consciousness. So it will be easier for you to interact with the crystal. In addition to that, the crystal's purpose will become more aligned with your purpose, and it can help you along that path. Um, you can also, while I'm doing the activation, you can also make a request that the, just silently to the crystal, that it will take on these properties that it, you would like for it to take on. If you've got something that you're dealing with, then you can, you know, align that crystal so that it will help you deal with that thing. So then what we discovered, <laughs> so because I always want evidence because I'm still that left brain person, we, we, what we noticed when, when the crystals were activated, we actually physically saw them change. Maybe they would get a new um, strata line through the middle of it, uh, a crack. Uh, maybe it would uh, change its hue. Maybe it would become more cloudy. Maybe it would become more clear. I mean, we were physically seeing it and we had multiple people standing around watching it happen and doing the best that we could to record it uh, visually. And every, every person said, yes, it's actually happening. That just changed. I know it's changed. So we said, all right. So I went to a crystal. I met some great people at, at a crystal shop and, and we went there with video cameras and we got everything all set up and we said, all right, we are going to get this. We're going to make a documentary about it. This is going to be great. So we did the four crystals, the biggest ones they had. And, and the, 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 the changes were so obvious that the biggest one had this giant crack in it after I did the activation that it did not have before. And, and the other thing that I noticed is, it was interesting is when I did the activation, that all the people in the room said, whoa, you know, I just changed. And that was surprising to me because I was so focused just on the crystal. I was like, all I want to do, <laughs> and I was e even being very careful because I'm in a crystal shop. I don't want to activate a, a thousand crystals when I do this. I want to activate just the one that I'm really focused on. So I, when I did that and everyone in the room said, whoa, you just changed me, <laughs> I, I, that was confusing. It m makes sense later because what we did is we, we, we went back and we watched the video recording of the crystal changing. And, 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 oh, there was somebody that had like their phone, you know, and they were watching the crystal change through their phone. And, you know, they had it on slow motion. So we, we we're going to get to see this. Um, rippling effect of the of the crystal changing in slow motion, and they were and they were looking at it through the phone, and they said, "I got it. There's no way I did not get that change. That is, you're, you're good." So we watched the footage. We didn't get it because everything in the footage looked like it it had always looked the way that it now looked. So that giant crack in that big one that wasn't there before throughout the entire video it was always there, even when I right in the middle of that video, when I, when I awakened it. So then we had to start doing some research. Like, why the heck is this happening? I ended up talking to a, a, a scientific friend of mine who's kind of a, you know, very studied. And he said, Oh, well, that's a time crystal. You're talking about time crystals. And so we did some research on that. And it turns out that there are these, these crystals that other scientists ha have been having the same problem. They're like, we can't get a video recording of this thing changing because it's always been that way. Okay, wait a minute. It's always been that way. Ah, I bet you I know what it is. And we got this confirmed with multiple channels. What we're doing is we're changing the timeline of the people so that they're shifting to a new, new timeline and that crystal now looks different to them but that crystal has always been that way in that particular timeline. So now what we realize is that crystals are a great representation of a timeline change. So even if I don't activate the crystal, you can take a really good mental note of what your crystal looks like. 
and you can check it every week, every month, every year and see if it's changed. And you know what? It will have changed because you're going to have changed timelines and you can even try to set it up like, oh, I just went through some sort of really amazing experience or I just got activated and something changed in me or whatever. Go look at your crystals. They probably changed because that's the the proof that you've changed timelines. This is really making me think that all healing is actually just aligning with the prime timeline that we are actually emanating from, in a sense. I've had this thought before that the limitations that we feel is actually, or like the concept of parallel universes is like that each of us is our, is a parallel universe generator. And that whenever we get out of sync with our full potential, which is infinite, then we create this sort of linear narrative, alternate universe timeline where that's the truth because we can and we go there. But that as we heal, that we're all coming back together to a prime timeline. And I think the advantage of this is that ideally we can get to a timeline where there's not any more of like hello and goodbye and wasting time, so to speak, with things like that and just being together and just (laughs) being in our fullness, which maybe we maybe it's infinite stairs, then we never actually get to timeline prime. But I feel like we're getting closer to it as a and I think that the person, the individual in question actually has the p- potential to go there or not, and that we are in each other's timelines regardless. And whenever we get more aligned with our prime timeline, then in other people's timelines, even those that are um, not getting aligned or feeling very dissonant, that we come in as a healer in that timeline, the, that once we are aligned with ourself true fully, then in, on, in and across all timelines, we are that self, if that makes sense. It's kind of... <laughs> it's, you know, it's one of those like just stoner <laughs> thought, <laughs> trains of thought, but yeah. And so the other thing too, is that I have, I have activated the book with the soul essence activation so that anybody who reads it receives, uh, their, their se- seven base chakras, uh, activated as well. Um, it doesn't seem like it's, well, I don't know. I, I don't know what how it actually works, but that example that I gave of that former coworker, I really, really believe that it affected him and he had uh, an obvious result from it. I can affirm it for myself and we'll see if I can infect more people by showing them the book. <laughs> I'm going to try. <laughs> nice. Well, tell people how they can get it and how they can support you and how they can connect with you. Give uh, the full plugs, everything that you'd like people to know about in the Zane Daniel world. Well, I think you've done an excellent job with all that. And and I don't want to spend a whole bunch of time on it because it it's really more about helping people than it is about selling things. You've you're gonna list the uh the web addresses, like you said, and you know, righteouscomic.com to to purchase. Uh, either PDFs or, or or physical copies of the books, um, uh, or going to zanedaniel.com, Zane with an X, to learn more about uh, my my activations and and how I might be able to help individuals who have all kinds of different issues. Uh, I'm actually working with a light worker right now. She's kind of unknown, and one of the things that we're we're really working on is um, is healing all kinds of different problems that people have. She has more of a a physical he- healing gift and mine is more of a mental emotional healing gift and so between the two of us we're working on a girl right now who has type 1 diabetes she's 12 years old and we're making progress um, like the, her pancreas is creating more insulin than it was before so we're very hopeful that we're going to be able to make some big differences in some people's lives helping them find the strength to heal themselves <laughs> Exactly. Right. Yeah. So it's because it's always both a mental and a physical thing. Right. And, and when someone comes to people like us, what we're doing is we're giving them permission to heal themselves. And, and so if we can kind of solve some of those mental issues and some of the physical issues, uh, through the energy healing that we're doing, working with our guides, um, and then, it does. It gives them the permission that they need to heal themselves. 
brilliant. I'll also want to shout out to your uh, your team and just let them know if they check out this episode, what a great job they've done with helping you bring Righteous into the world. The artists, the colorists, uh, I'm sure the editors have had a big hand in it. And altogether, this is quite something special you guys have birthed into the reality. And I do hope all of you listening, go check it out. You will feel you will feel infected after after you read it. <laughs> Probably on like the first couple pages, you're like, oh shit, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Read our book and you'll be you'll get our disease. <laughs> cool, man. Well, thanks for being here with me and we'll close up this recording. Had a blast. It was exceeding expectations for sure. Although I try not to, you know, limit things by expectations, but I knew it was going to be great. And it was capital G great for sure. Awesome. Oh, thank you so much. And you're a great host. I really enjoy talking to you and hearing your perspective and, and being able to bounce off of your, your great perspectives. I, I think that we're a good team. I knew we would be after, uh, after watching your videos and reading your book, I was like, this is my people right here. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, Zane. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Bye-bye. Thanks again. Hey, all right. How you feeling after that talk? Good? Good? Me too. I'm even feeling righteous, you could say. <laughs> but seriously, what an awesome chat that was. Zane is a fascinating guy on many levels. Definitely got into a lot more things than I initially expected when I saw that there was a comic book guy reaching out to me for a show. And really, across all spectrums and genres and mediums, I've never seen a story like Righteous. It is totally unique. Extremely grateful that I got to read it. And I felt activated just by turning the pages on that thing. And I also got myself a, a physical copy of the first five chapters, which is something I intend to treasure and cherish and share with friends who want something to entertain them while they're around me for 30 or 45 minutes or an hour, however long it takes to read one of those. It's a lot quicker of a medium, as Zane was uh, saying, than any other to transmit a full and complete story and, and information. Comic books are magical like that. They really do open up the imagination because you are using it just to fill the action frame by frame, and there's a lot more to it than that. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, but what about a bunch of pictures that have words too? <laughs> but seriously, couldn't have been happier with how that talk turned out, and I feel like Zane is definitely a soul brother from past timelines. We have interacted before probably in previous incarnations and who knows how that all works exactly but it definitely feels like it i hope you're on interverse plus for this one because we definitely got into the fascinating things in the second hour as always not that the first hour wasn't good i really enjoyed talking about especially the late stage capitalism and changing our incentive programs from fear-based to love-based and all that but in the plus extension is where we get into the master stuff. <laughs> like, I mean, becoming a master of your own timeline, remembering that you're literally a time lord, that you can go into any future that you want, basically just by intending it and making sure you align your thoughts, behaviors, and actions towards it. And boom. Other things we talked about were light beings like the Hathors, Arcturians, and other star nations. And very interesting topic was identifying and activating chakras beyond the crown, which I think is a big topic that needs to start getting explored more and more because we're really locked into a seven based system, a cosmic framework of seven, a septenary, if you will. And it's not exactly the truth because yeah, there's seven colors in the prism, but what about white and black? Are they not colors too? Isn't it a, a nine based system? But every spiritual system that we've got is pretty much saying it's seven, it's seven, seven rulers, seven archons, seven planets. I think it's nine, and we got to get past the eight before we can get to the nine, eight being the infinite loop, if you will. <laughs> so let's think about that one. Let's figure out what we need to do to activate the eighth and ninth and beyond chakras. We talked about what those were, that the eighth chakra specifically, we talked about it as the halo chakra. And he told a really good anecdote about how that does have something to do with protection from lower density energies whenever that chakra is activated. So why don't you ask yourself to activate that eighth chakra right now and maybe it'll happen. 
We did talk about the fractal dimensions of the chakra system all the way from the Earth star to the source, all up and down the whole spectrum. Discussed light language and intuitively intoning healing sounds with the throat chakra. I really love that. Talked about assisting other people's soul activation across long distances and times and the light worker training that helped Zane advance in his vibration so that he could be who he is today and keep on evolving and advancing. Talked about Cherokee ancestry that we both share and potential past lives in these tribes that were basically annihilated by the sickness of the European peoples that came over here. Although, to be fair, there's evidence in my in my mind that the nations all around the world were suffering from the same vibrational dissonance and it's just some were more representative of the destroying than others but generally speaking the earth needs to get back on balance and we need to get through this disharmonic phase which we are i say need it's really it is happening <laughs> we are doing it so don't worry <laughs> just keep working on yourself and it's going to happen you're going to align with that timeline that's what being a master of time itself really means is that you get to go where you choose other things we talked about, uh, well, actually, this was very interesting. Zane activated a selenite crystal for me, and possibly if you were listening to that in the plus extension, you might be able to use that same methodology or even that recording to activate a crystal for yourself and just talk to it and make it happen. We discussed crystal consciousness and how these things are living beings, which I love talking about crystals. I can never get enough of that. And we talked about what we love about comics as a medium which we could probably go deeper next time that we have Zane on to discuss comic books at large because I love that medium. But that was it. That was the plus extension. I mean, I say that was it. Really, there's more than that, but I can only give you so many highlights. I can't give it all away. Otherwise, why would you go sign up? If you're wondering how to sign up and get the two-hour conversation with Zane, it is at patreon.com forward slash interverse where we are hoping to assist your ascension process by giving you all the tools you need in your mental kit to be able to get past division and duality and into unity in as many aspects as you can. At least that's what I'm trying to do for myself. And it definitely accelerates my growth. The more that I look for the unifying instead of the dividing ways of looking at stuff. So I believe where we're at right now in the ascension process, it's like humanity is a um, popcorn that's popping, right? It starts off slow and then gets more steady and rapid. And I believe that Righteous is really a reflection, this comic story, of the fact that we are in the accelerating phase right now of the popcorn popping, the Ascension popcorn. So maybe next time on uh, Zane's next appearance, we'll do an actual soul essence activation, which would be really cool. But in the meantime, you can, like I was mentioning, go find him on the Awaken Empowered Expo YouTube channel, which I linked in the show notes and get a soul essence activation through that chakra activation. Pretty cool. I felt that it was effective and it's something that you might want to check out or try or hit Zane up himself to do it in a one-on-one -on -one session, which of course is going to be even greater. Do go read Righteous, especially because I want you to be involved with it for the next volume that's coming out. I don't know exactly how soon because of a sort of selfish reason. Apparently, I'm going to have a cameo in volume three. There's going to be a frame with me in it reacting to something. And that's really exciting because I've never been a character in a comic book before. Just wanted to throw that out there that there's a lot of reasons beyond just that. But especially that to see me in a comic book, you better start following Righteous. <laughs> it is a great, great story, though. I I can't speak highly of it enough. I want to talk more about it without spoiling it, but it's tricky. So we'll just say that it's going to inspire you. Now, something I want to talk about before we move past the outro section here is that a lot recently has come up for me in the show and just in with other people, ideas about other beings like star nations, light beings, what have you that maybe even some of us think that we're from these other planets or star systems and that we are here on some kind of mission or assignment. And I want to reflect on this with you all and think about a different way of looking at it and that maybe we're actually dividing ourselves in a way just by saying that I'm from some other star system and not from Earth. Because if you really have no evidence that you're not from Earth, you're in a body, 
you're growing out of the body. The body is like something that comes out of a seed that becomes a tree. And the seed or the spark is your consciousness or your infinite source energy. But then once the seed transforms into the tree or becomes the body like you're in, it is the tree. The seed is not anywhere physical, right? So my point in saying this is the energy that is making you up is from this system that we call earth. You're rooted in it. It's your foundation. And I think it helps us make an enemy of the earth and the people on it in our minds, even unconsciously. Maybe we don't do it while realizing it if we're saying it we're from somewhere else. So the best thing to remember is just that all is self, which means that you can talk to any non-physical and non-local beings and entities anytime you want, but that's because non-physical and non-local just means they're inside you. They are part of you. And actually everything that you consider physical and local and around in the material world is actually inside you. The whole projection that you're experiencing is a hologram that is coming out of your own personal projector. You're the one creating all of it. It's you. And there's no reason to be like, I'm from this star system. You're from that star system. And in fact, if you really get into the knowledge, those things don't really exist the way that the whole NASA model of the cosmos is showing those other places, other planets like Earth being a spinning ball flying through the void and disconnected from source and just sort of in a random chaotic journey through nothingness. All that is pretty damaging and divisive to your consciousness to actually believe. And let's just stick to what we can know, which is that everything is subjective, everything is mental, and everything is essentially the same as the dream that you have at night, but that we're doing it in a shared way. And actually, the, all the beings that you experience in your waking reality are still just projections from the same larger mind, just like the beings you meet in your personal dreams at night are projections from your mind. I wanted to make this clear. I don't know if I've made it super clear, but just, and I'm not saying Zane that, that Zane was like, I'm from Hathor. He's saying he's working with beings from this cluster of, of star systems or, or whatever. I would even call them thought forms, thought systems more than star systems, because those realms that we're describing, if you really get into the esoteric element of it, it's just that these are actually constellations of energy in our system. And they're higher constellations of energy in that they're higher vibrational, maybe, and closer to source. And that is still within you. It's not like out there, light years and light years away, far away. We didn't come here from light years away. Aliens didn't come and make humanity. There is no aliens. <laughs> Everything, all of that is actually feeling like racism. Not maybe that you feel that you're a racist. Of course, you probably don't feel that way. I doubt you are but is fueling all the different forms of isms of like, I'm this, but not that to say that you're from, even that you're from a country, you know, you're not really from a country because the country is not real. The only thing that's real is earth and we're from earth. We're from our source. Yeah. But man, I guess I won't ramble about this too much more, but I, I just want us to be really clear that it doesn't, you don't need to be an alien to be special. I know Zane understands this too. <laughs> That's why I'm making it more clear. You're already special. You're already everything. You're already infinite in every sense. And so if you want to talk to beings that call themselves Arcturians or Hathors, I like it. I think it's fun. I think sometimes that I do get messages that are just beamed into my mind from a higher part of the framework. And that is cool. It's just about realizing that really in general, you don't own your thoughts just like you don't own anything and you don't have to therefore be attached to your thoughts or your ideas or your conceptions about self. It should all just be pretty fluid and consistently moving and flowing. And that's what it, I guess means to be constantly in a state of evolution is that you're not stuck with any one idea about yourself that you have to be this and this is it. This is who you are because any of that is limiting. When you really get down to talking about the source or the supreme being, even calling it any of that stuff is tricky because as soon as you define something and try to give it a name, you're trying to own it or encompass it. And really, you're limitless and you can't even be encompassed. So might as well not even try <laughs> to put yourself in any boxes or labels or limitations at all. And you'll find that you expand more rapidly the less you, that you do that. So 
I also will talk about video games for a second. We talked about video games a lot, maybe even made them seem like a bad thing. I don't know that they're really a bad thing. In the last episode with Hakan, we did talk about them as part of like the false light matrix of hypnotizing us into complete false gnosis with entertainment and the video games were part of that. I agree, but it's our choice to be hypnotized. We self-hypnotize. So if you're playing a video game and you're not feeling hypnotized, if you're not having a message from yourself that's like, you're doing this at the expense of other things that would be to your benefit, you're doing this too much, you know, you'll get those messages from yourself if you're doing something out of balance. And maybe it's not really typically ever a balanced thing to go play Mortal Kombat, which happens to have an 11th iteration that was just recently released, I noticed. Interesting that it starts with MK. It reminds me of like MK Ultra <laughs> because Mortal Kombat, the combat is spelled with a K. But whatever. There's lots of games out there that are not crazy gory and violent and about murder and mayhem. One I just finished that was just beyond beautiful is called Rime. R-I-M-E. It is a puzzle type of platforming game. Beautiful graphics, beautiful soundtrack made by an extremely creative team out of Spain. I enjoyed the game. It was far deeper in its message and its meaning than what it appears on the surface and was really worth going through to the end. So there's a game I recommend and I didn't get like obsessed or stuck on it where I had to play it constantly or where it was invading my mind when I wasn't playing it with thoughts about it. And now there's another one that I've been playing on occasion called Supraland, which I think was made all by one guy. And this game is about... (laughs) basically like a sandbox universe that a kid has built and you're this little toy that runs around the sandbox. It is a huge open world puzzle exploration game, kind of like a mix between Portal and Metroid, maybe with some Legend of Zelda flavor thrown in there too. I love it. It's really creative. It's really stimulating. It's really fun, really engaging. It doesn't feel repetitive or like you're on this track of endless... um, progression that's like messing with your psychology the way that a lot of rpg ified games do like me and zane did talk about a bit so anyway there's just a couple of games that i think could be played consciously and enjoyed consciously and not really to your detriment and just wanted to throw that out there that games are not evil (laughs) even though some games kind of (laughs) are in in, in many ways have some evil going on in that evil is what is distortion that is keeping the continuity and growth and evolution and progress of life halted. So if your life is being halted in any way by something you're doing, well, then I guess you could call that evil. And it could be anything. And we might as well not be judging everything under the same blanket statement. And man, I also wanted to thank Zane one more time for reaching out, being on the show with me, and for doing what he's doing and so bravely switching careers at a point in his life where it would have been way easier to just stick with what he knew. It is truly inspirational and I love having his friendship. Can't wait for Righteous Volume 3. Volume 2 came out around the time that we recorded this episode. So you got 10 whole chapters because each volume is five chapters. If you want to go get into Righteous and be inspired by the story of Daniel Price, the risk analyst who became super woke and started saving the world, starting with Kansas City, Missouri, which is a cool place to start. It's pretty close to me. Now, remember that you can find Interverse Plus everywhere from YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, iTunes podcast app. Every podcast playing app that you could ever want is probably going to find Interverse if you search for it on there. And I'd love it if you subscribed across all platforms. Find me on Instagram and Facebook. There's a lot going on on my Facebook with live streaming lately to promote the upcoming Backwoods Music Festival, which by the time you're hearing this is only a couple weeks away, taking place from May 31st to June 2nd. I'd love you guys to come out there because I'm doing a live podcast. I'm going to be vending my own art and creations and also hosting some of my friends from their areas, art and creations as well, who do festival vending. So we're going to have quite a great setup at Backwoods. We'll be really having fun on the live podcast. (laughs) And I intend to get the whole crowd involved with that in some way, shape, or form. So come out to Backwoods and 
have a great time on Mulberry Mountain with us. Get away from the supposed real world and into the flow of synchronicity with your festival tribe family. If you've never been to a festival, this would be a really cool place to start. Even if you don't know the music that's on the lineup, you could just go for the workshops and the craft vendors and be entertained. And I guarantee you'd also stumble upon some music that you thought was really good and groovy. And dancing and movement is like the strongest form of medicine for your body that there is. I do want to see you all out there. So come out to Backwoods. And then the last thing I want to tell you, other than that you can find Zane's comic at RighteousComic.com and Zane Daniel at ZaneDaniel.com with an X, not a Z, is that I picked some music from the game I mentioned earlier, Rhyme, to be the outro. This amazing composition, original soundtrack, by Spanish composer David Garcia Diaz. I picked a song from that soundtrack to put in the outro music just because it was so beautiful and emotionally stirring and inspiring to hear that music throughout the game that I figured it would be cool to put in here. Always looking for something new and different to feature at the end of a show. So I'll link him on SoundCloud as well. You can find David Garcia Diaz, amazing composer. And that's it for me today. Much more coming up soon. Already got some interviews in the shoot ready to be produced and put out. So thanks for being with me. Don't forget about signing up on Patreon if you want the two-hour show. If you already are a patron, you know who you are. And thank you for helping me make this show more and more possible. Oh, and also I'll remind you that there's a link to Secret Energy at the top of my website and also in the show notes to this episode where if you click the link and you pick up any of the vibration-enhancing and cleansing type of products that they have on that site you'll be tossing a 9% commission on your purchase to the podcast. I don't really want to ever advertise anybody on this show, but as far as this goes, I like being affiliated with Secret Energy because I use these products, and I actually think that the more of us that are raising our vibration and purifying and cleansing our internal organs, the faster the whole planetary ascension thing is going to happen. So there's a lot of reasons why I decided Secret Energy is something I want to be affiliated with for for good and to point you guys towards it every episode and there's lots there i won't go on too much but you can find all the info you need at secretenergy.com on these very very good products that they offer there and hope you check it out and also if you think it sounds cool to get nine percent commission for pointing people towards products that help heal them ask me how you can become an affiliate yourself it's really easy and we can set that up Anyway, thanks for talking to me or listening to me talk, I should say. Hit me up online. Show Zane some love online as well. Righteous Comic on Instagram, at Righteous Comic on Facebook as well. And we're out of here. Talk to you guys next week. Love you all. Wholeness and harmony. <laughs>